I definitely look at scripture now as a Catholic differently than I did as, as a Protestant, but it's not that I would have, if you'd asked me 15 years ago, I would have thought, well, different traditions read different things into scripture. In fact, I knew this about the Reformed tradition, that the Reformed tradition had this idea of limited atonement, that Christ died just for the elect and for no one else. And yet right in 1 John 2, 2, it says, John says, for Christ died not for our sins only, but for the sins of the whole world. It, it's the verse you would write to contradict the doctrine of limited atonement. So I already sat a little loosely on the kind of systematic theologies of different traditions. What I became acutely aware of, though, when studying these Catholic questions, is how many passages of scripture I simply read over. I just simply didn't have an, I didn't have a story for it. I just didn't really notice it when Jesus was saying, you know, you're Peter and on this rock I'm gonna build my church. There is a Protestant take on that, but that was just a verse that I read past. Uh, John 6, you must chew my flesh and drink my blood if you're to have life in you. That's another ver the sort of like, what passage would you need to write if you're the Apostle John to make the real presence clear? That's one of those passages. And if you spend time studying, exegeting, doing careful exegesis of these texts, read what Christians who canonized these texts thought they meant, and then ask yourself, okay, what's, what's the sort of more honest reading to this? And so it's not as if um, Catholics, well, we have these other sources in addition to scripture and we sort of impose them. No, um, if our claim's right, we're being faithful to scripture. It was the church that compiled scripture and decided based upon the faith passed on from the apostles, whether something should be in scripture. There's that prior question, right? What book should be a part of the canon? And so the early church had to have a criteria to do that. It seems sort of obvious once, once you notice it, but it's a, one of these questions that a lot of Christians don't ever spend any time reflecting on. The doctrine of sola scripture, I think for even a lot of sophisticated Protestant theologians understand, okay, look, you don't learn chemistry and calculus and lot, there are things outside scripture that we know about and that we ought to know. Nevertheless, I, I think the kind of Achilles heel of sola scriptura um, is that it's a view of scripture as sort of just standing on its own, sort of floating out there, not sort of rooted to anything. And Because you have to say, okay, look, if you believe that scripture is the sole source for all relevant kind of theological authority, where in scripture does it say that? It's got, I mean, philosophically, you've got a kind of self-reference problem. If, on the other hand, Jesus did what he promised to do in, in Scripture, to leave a church and to send the Holy Spirit, right, then you would assume that if he planned that, he also planned a way to uh, decide what was legitimately part of Scripture and what was not. And so simply in terms of historical sequence, uh, the Catholic claim of these things makes more sense and in many ways really puts Scripture into its proper place and gives it its proper dignity. It's not just sort of floating out there without any kind of philosophical defense.